All right, guys. Part nine, what Christians believe, part nine. As we come up to Easter weekend, we are going to come face to face with the cross. And as we look at the question of the cross, and, and the mystery of the cross, and the wonder of the cross, as we've sung about this morning, <clears throat> it raises some questions. And first of all, it raises the question, how did Jesus die? What actually took place? What, what is crucifixion? What, what is that all about? But it also raises, and perhaps an even more important question, why did Jesus die? What was the point of all of this cruelty and wickedness of him being nailed to this cross and his death? And then another question that comes out of the why is, is how did his death accomplish our salvation? How, how did, how did if, if he died for our salvation, if he died for our sins, which we're going to talk about, how did that act actually accomplish that? So those are the questions we're going to address this morning as we continue this systematic theology sermon series, What Christians Believe. And so the first question, how did Jesus die? Let's actually look at the event. So we know that near the end of Jesus' ministry, there's a turning point where he, it says that he turns his face towards Jerusalem, where he now he knows that he's in the last stretch, and he starts heading towards Jerusalem, heading towards what he, he knows is going to result in his death. And on a Sunday, he arrives... Palm Sunday, as we know it, as we talked about earlier, and he enters into the city. And he spends a week in the city, teaching, flipping over tables in the temple, doing lots of stuff this week in Jerusalem. And on Thursday night, he he gathers with his uh, disciples after the Last Supper, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's, he's praying through the night, and he's feeling an immense amount of stress and anxiety because he knows what's going to happen. Judas has taken off. So he's he's praying in the garden and it says that he's he prays like sweat drops of blood. And we don't know whether that's just like sweat drops of blood or I think it actually he was praying blood. Or not praying, he was uh, sweating blood. So he was under such an amount of stress that Blood vessels were bursting in his body. It was terrifying for him. His human nature was wrestling with this, what, with what he knew was going was gonna to happen. Then he's arrested, and he's, he's dragged by the Roman authorities to the home of the high priest, Caiaphas, and he, he's held trial, this late night, probably illegal trial by the Sanhedrin, these Jewish authorities. And they make all these false accusations against him. They're so false that they don't, the people making the accusations don't even agree with each other. <clears throat> but they call him a blasphemer and they, they spit on him. And they blindfold him and beat him up. And they jeer at him and they slap him as they drag him off. To the Roman authorities. <clears throat> so then he goes before the Roman authorities for another trial. And the crowd wants crucifixion. <laughs> crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate wrestles with it as well. He, he, he's, he's torn, but he's, his main interest is he wants peace. He wants to just keep calm. This is Passover time. It's busy. He's responsible for keeping peace. So he just goes with what the crowd wants. He orders Jesus to be crucified. So there's some stages that take place in the act of crucifixion. First, uh, Jesus was whipped. And they used a lead-tipped whip, it says, in the Gospel of Luke. Or maybe Jesus, or in the Gospel of John, I think it was, actually. He used a lead-tipped whip, <clears throat> which, which uh, sometimes is called a, a cat of nine tails. Probably was a cat of nine tails which is this whip that has many different strands on the end, and there's, the ends are weighted. And 
sometimes they're weighted with like broken pottery and different things like that so that when, when the whip would land, it would actually tear the flesh and rip, and when, when it comes back, it would rip the flesh off. Many people getting crucified didn't even survive this first stage. But Jesus apparently was in great shape. He made it through. <clears throat> but I'm sure was severely disfigured, unrecognizable, maybe with blood and just terrible. Then they mocked him. They put a purple robe on him, on his bare, wounded back and shoulders. They draped this purple robe on him and they called him the king of the Jews. Hail, king of the Jews. And they took a, made a crown of thorns and they drove that into his scalp. Very sensitive part of your, your body as well. And he was then made to carry the beam of the cross, the heavy beam that he would be crucified on, made to carry that up to the hill. Um, this was a used cross. They reused all the crosses, so this was not a clean thing. And they put this on his back and shoulders as well that was wounded. And he tried his best, but he collapsed under the weight of that, under the agony and he was helped by Simon of Cyrene. They get him up to the hill. They strip him naked. At some point in this process, stripped naked, exposed. And then they would have laid him across this thing and driven nails through his hands and through his feet, very sensitive parts of the body as well. By now, his body had probably gone into shock. And... Then, I think what may have been one of the worst parts of it is then they have to actually raise the cross up so they would elevate the cross and then it would fall down into the hole and there would be a thud and you can just imagine the pain of that thrusting of his body down on the nails. All this time there's a crowd gathered around, a crowd some of the people who loved him were there to be with him, but most of the crowd would have been filled up with the worst kind of people who would find this sort of thing entertaining. And they were there shouting at him. And while the Roman soldiers gambled for his clothing. And Jesus hung there, and he, in the, in the hot sun, and would have died a slow and painful agonizing death. The word excruciating comes from the same word as crucify. And most people who died of who were crucified died of asphyxiation. There's the pressure they couldn't because they couldn't get their breath and they would die eventually of asphyxiation. It's ultimately death by torture is what it is. Death by torture. The Romans were good at killing people, okay? Really good at killing people. Now, I don't tell you all of this to try to gross you out. I tell you this to help you grasp the reality of what took place. Don't sanitize the cross. Don't gloss over it. It was serious. It was about as horrible as anything that could happen to a human being. And they did it to Jesus, and he let them do it. So then the question is, why? Why? Why did God in the flesh allow this to take place? <clears throat> well, the answer, simply, go to the next slide, please. Why did Jesus die? The answer is simply, really, and this is like a Sunday school answer, right? But it is so true and so important. He died for our sins. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. He died so that we could be saved from our sin. We've been talking, we've been using these chairs, and I just want to do this just one more time, just as, as I think this is a really helpful reminder for us, this, that God, when he created humankind created us for fellowship with him. This is 
what he wanted. This is God. This is man. And he wants us face to face with him in this beautiful relationship of harmony. This is what he designed for us. But our sin has separated us from God. We've turned our back to, to God and gone our own way. And so there has been a separation as a result of that. Now, we can attempt to turn our lives around. We can, we can attempt to get back on track, but we're never going to do that very long or very fully before we are back screwing up again, going our own way, because we've got a terminal sin condition. We can't do it all on our own. We, we can't, we, we, we're just, we've got this not ongoing problem of sin, and as much as we try to do our best and to follow God, we never can do it. We can never be holy and perfect enough. And so we've got this problem, this separation. And so that's why Jesus came and died, right? He, Jesus came in pursuit of us to do what we could not do, to die in our place so that we could be reconciled back to God. That's why Jesus died, to take our sin upon himself and in doing so, to save us from our sin. Now, I want to just show on the, on the whiteboard here to another simple way of illustrating this. Here is the cross, and here is man. And by man, I mean men and women, humans. Okay, now I'm very much a visual learner, so this very simple thing may be helpful to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, He became sin who knew no sin, so that we, through him, might become the righteousness of God. Okay? There's been, a, there's been a beautiful exchange that has taken place. Our sin has gone on to Jesus, and his righteousness has been transferred on to us. This is the transaction that has taken place. And in doing so, he has made it possible for us to be in fellowship, in, in relationship with, with God. And I'm just going to make God in a cloud here, even though we know God is not in the, He's not a cloud. So Jesus takes our sin and our shame and our guilt, our wickedness, our brokenness, and he bears all of that on, on himself on the cross, and he removes it from us when we believe that in faith, when we trust in him, and we receive his righteousness, justification by faith. And as a result, we have fellowship with Almighty God, eternal life. Okay? So this is why Jesus died, for our sin, to make this, to restore this relationship. Now, I'm going to read uh, in uh, the book of Isaiah. If you have a Bible... Please turn there. I'm going to read this morning from the New Living Translation, though I normally preach from uh, the English Standard Version. Today I'm going to use the New Living because this is a long passage, and uh, the New Living Translation is really an easy read, and I just want you to be able to pay attention and not fall asleep, okay? So, even because it's a long passage. So we're going to start in Isaiah 52, verse uh, 13. Now this, keep in mind, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus. Hundreds of years. And yet it lays out so perfectly what we just talked about. It just is crystal clear the degree of his suffering that we've talked about and also what it accomplished. And, and yet this is a prophecy. This is a, this is a foretelling of what was to come. Isaiah 52, verse 13. See, God says, my servant, talking about Christ will prosper. He will be highly exalted. Yes, he will. That's the resurrection. But, but there's a but. Before that happens, something terrible is going to happen. Many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. This is talking about the cross. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard about. Now, chapter 53. 
Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He, was, he, he appeared to be a regular guy. He grew up in the town of Nazareth in Galilee, a small town. You know, what good comes out of Nazareth? Just an average guy. You wouldn't think he wasn't born in a palace. He's not part of, you know, he wasn't uh, uh, the heir to an earthly throne at that point. You know, the, this is just an average guy. And what happened to him? He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. So that's what happened. This is the pain and the agony and the suffering that he experienced. Now here's the why. Yet it was our, our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And when we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but no, it wasn't for anything he'd done wrong. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. There's that exchange. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord, Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word, meaning he didn't put up a fight. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned. This was not a fair trial. There was no crime he committed. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. Again, you see it over and over again. He was crucified for our sins. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. That's exactly what happened. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. This was not a surprise to God. This was not the defeat of God. This actually, God knew this was going to happen. This was part of God's plan of salvation from the very beginning. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Yes, he didn't have any children. But boy, oh boy, we all get to join the family because of this, don't we? He will enjoy a long life. Yeah, he's going to be resurrected. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all of their sins. There's that exchange again. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. Oh, man. That is good. Man, if you don't read your Bible, you are missing out because, man, the Bible is just rich. Now, this is what we call... The atonement, the atonement, next slide there, atonement. And the word atonement, if you look it up in, in a dictionary, in a Christian context, the word atonement means the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. If you break that word down, at atonement, it really literally is at one mint, at one mint. It is this, it is this being at one with God being in harmony, being in relationship with God instead of being separated, to make amends. And so, as we've talked about this, Jesus came, he died for our sins, he took our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness, made it possible for us to be atoned for and be reconciled back to God. How? How? 
How did Jesus' death make our salvation possible? How did Jesus, getting nailed to this cross 2,000 years ago, make it possible for us to be atoned for, for us to be reconciled back to God? Now, this is a really important question. I had a, a professor at St. Evex when I was a student there, my undergrad, non-Christian professor, and uh, he asked me in class one time this question. So we, there was about three or four of us that were Christians in this class. And, you know, we weren't ashamed of our faith, so we, it was known that we were Christians. And, uh, and he asked us this question one time. You know, you talk about Jesus dying on the cross. Well, how did his death win, our, win your salvation then? Tell us about that. And we were like, uh, you know, all we had was the Sunday school answer. He died for our sins. Well, how? What does that mean? How did that trans- like, How did Jesus' death mean you get saved? We couldn't answer it. And it forced us to, to study more, you know? And that's a good thing. I'm so thankful that he asked me that question because it caused me to then go and understand the cross. And, and so I am never shy away from hard questions. I think you should always ask the hard questions. This is one of the reasons I love Alpha. We do on Wednesday nights, you know, because Alpha is all about asking those hard questions. And I tell you what, I get asked really hard questions at Alpha. And I don't always have uh, simple answers. Uh, but, uh, but it's good to ask those hard questions and to, and to seek out the answer. So, let me tell you this morning, this is a question, this idea of the atonement, of how did this take place, that lots of people had res- have wrestled with. That theologians, actually, since the very beginning, have tried to answer and have, haven't always agreed on. We call these the theories of the atonement. Theories of the atonement. So the fact is, the atonement happened. We know that. That's fact. Theory, how did it work? We're, we can't fully agree on that. Um, so I just want to go through. There's, not, there's about seven, most theologians would say, there's probably seven theories of the atonement. Uh, I'm just going to highlight three, kind of four this morning. And, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to go through them fairly, pretty quickly and then make one last point. Now this is where we're going to get, it's going to get a little bit theological. It's going to get a little bit seminary. It's going to get a little bit, whoosh, over, maybe over your head a little bit. I I hope that I make it clear. Uh, if you don't get it all, you can always go back and watch the video again. But let me, just, um, let me just try to highlight these. So, the first of these uh, theories that I want to talk about this morning is called the Ransom Theory or Christus Victor. Go to the next slide, please, there. Okay, Ransom Theory or Christus, Christus Victor, meaning Christ the Victor. Uh, this is uh, the oldest of the atonement theories, okay? So we can trace this approach to understanding what Jesus accomplished on the cross all the way back to the early church fathers, guys like Origen and, uh, and Augustine and whatnot, okay? And, and so they, they believe, they called it the ransom theory based on Mark 10, 45, where Jesus says, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom. For many, as a ransom. So that caused the question in their minds well, if Jesus paid a ransom to win us or to, to release us, who did he pay the ransom to? They asked this question. And they said, well, surely he didn't pay a ransom to God. God didn't have us in bondage, right? There's nothing to. So this is what they said. Uh, they would say, clearly, he must have paid a ransom to the devil. Because the devil, the sin is what has had us in bondage. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to symbolize the devil here with a pitchfork, even though that's probably not a very accurate depiction of the devil at all. But this is a, you know, the, the devil is going to be symbolized by a pitchfork. Okay. So they would say, they would have said that since Adam and Eve sinned, the devil, Satan, has had us bound in sin. Uh, and so we'll just do like a lasso here around mankind. Satan has had us bound up by sin since Adam and Eve. And because of that, we're unable to have a relationship with God, as we've talked about. Okay? We, we cannot escape the grasp of Satan. It's like he's holding us hostage. And so then, Jesus comes along, and Jesus says, okay, I want to release the hostages so that they can be reconciled back to God. And so, I'm going to make a deal with the devil. I am going to pay the ransom. To the devil. So Jesus makes this deal. Okay, Satan, here is what I will pay 
to you to release people. I will give you myself. I will die. If you release all of humanity, you can have me. And the devil goes, hmm, I like the sounds of that. It's a deal. And so, Jesus goes to the cross, releasing all of us from this bondage that Satan has us in. And Satan feels as though he has won, right? He, 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 he is the one who, who ultimately kills Jesus because he goes, he, uh, goes into Judas, right? Satan goes into Judas, and Judas leads to this death of Christ. And Satan has won. People are released. He's happy. But Jesus outsmarted Satan, <laughs> Right? Jesus outsmarted the devil. This was, uh, he tricked him because the devil was only looking at Jesus' humanity. He forgot about Jesus' divinity. Satan was looking at the cross. He didn't know about the resurrection. And so these theologians, Origen and Augustine and all these guys, they would say that it was sort of like um, a fish hook. That Jesus', Jesus uh, humanity was bait on this hook. The cross was bait, and the devil took the bait. But Jesus' divinity, or Jesus' resurrection, was the fish hook, and Satan got caught. And when Jesus rose from the dead, Satan realized, realized, oh no, I've been fooled, and Satan's been defeated. Jesus rose from the death over victorious over the grave we're released and now the devil still tries to get us you know he tries to deceive us and tries to fool us into into putting us back into bondage but he can't if we've trusted in christ we're set free so that's the ransom theory now a variation on that that came out of the uh, protestant reformation martin luther and these guys they said well we don't really like the sounds of jesus having to make a deal with the devil right because the devil is not equal to God. And Jesus is God. He doesn't have to make a deal with the devil. That's just kind of silly. So they didn't agree with that concept. But they did think that generally the principle of Jesus winning victory over evil was right. And so they called it Christus Victor. Christ the Victor. Okay? And here they say it's not so much the devil as it's, as it's really evil. So they would say sin and death and the devil collectively, which would be evil, that evil and sin and death, we were all bound by that because, because of our sin, which we agree with. The Bible is pretty clear on that. Uh, we were held bondage by sin. And so what happened is when Jesus died on the cross, all the forces of evil converged. If you imagine that hill, Mount Calvary, Golgotha, it's like all the wickedness, the devil, and all of the, the worst kind of human intentions, and, and all the, the forces of ill intent and wickedness and evil, all just came all together in one spot, all at the same time, and we killed God. I mean, the worst thing that humans could do, we killed God. And Jesus let it happen. And so the image there is that evil wins. Death reigns. But Christ rises from the dead. And it's really in the resurrection that we have our salvation. Because then Christ rises from the dead and he says, No, evil does not win. I win. I am the victor. Evil is not going to have the final say. And so, uh, so Jesus' kingdom of love defeats Satan's kingdom of death. Evil put Christ on the cross, but resurrection shows that he is more powerful than sin and death. Love wins. It's sort of like, a, it's like a, the Chronicles of Narnia, right? Have you ever seen the Chronicles of Narnia? And Aslan, the lion who represents Jesus, you know, evil, he, he allows himself to die and to be killed by the wicked people. All these little evil creatures, and they kill this lion. And you think evil's won. But then, resurrection. Aslan comes back to life. And you realize, no, Aslan is the victor. Jesus is the victor. 
that the Chronicles of Narnia is a Christus Victor atonement theory, by the way. Um, and so, love wins. And as a result, we are freed from the power of sin. Right? No longer sin has us bound. Christ's resurrection has set us free. And then free to have relationship with God. So the main emphasis in the Christus Victor or ransom theory, the main emphasis, the main idea of that is that what Jesus did on the cross was he set us free. So it's all about our freedom. Freedom. Now, for about a thousand years of church history, this was, what, this was the main idea. This, this is what the church held to. And then a, a guy named Anselm comes along. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Anselm of Canterbury. And, and Anselm, Anselm says, this is around the year 1000, he says, I don't really think that the ransom or Christus Victor theory, at that time it was really just the ransom theory, he says, I don't really think that the ransom theory uh, is the best way of understanding the cross. And he looks at the scriptures and he thinks that they're telling a different story. And so he comes up with the satisfaction theory, or again, that the Protestant reformers would rebrand penal substitution. I made an error, I just realized, that it wasn't the Protestant reformers that came up with Christus Victor. Ransom and Christus Victor came up at different... Ransom was first, then Christus Victor. It was the Protestant reformers that came up with the next one, penal substitution. So forgive me for that error. Penal substitution. Next slide, please. Okay. So Ransom and Christus Victor. So then we have this guy Anselm who comes up with satisfaction theory and then the Protestant reformers say, yes, we like this and what we're going to call the penal substitution theory. Okay, you still with me? Penal substitution. All right, okay. I didn't see as many nods as I was hoping for. You still with me? Okay, uh, I'm still not getting 100%. That's okay. All right, penal substitution. Now, these are big words. I'm sorry. This is what I would say most of us have been taught, would be my guess. And it's, it's probably the theory of the atonement that is most clearly laid out in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. It's the understanding of the atonement that I primarily preach and teach as I teach the Word of God. In a nutshell, the penal substitution theory says that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't so much a transaction with evil or with the devil that was taking place, Really, it was a transaction with God that was taking place. Not that Jesus was paying a ransom to God, although they would say probably that's the best way to interpret that passage. Um, but that there was something else happening. And so you would say, human sin is serious. Yes, we see that clearly in Scripture. Human sin is serious. It's grievous to a holy God. And because God is a just judge, right? We're looking at this sort of from a legal framework. Because God is a just judge, sin must be punishment. It must be punished. There is a cost and a consequence to sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so God has seen us in our sinfulness since Adam and Eve. And he says, they're guilty. He declares us in his justice guilty. And he pronounces the death penalty. And so here we have uh, sort of symbolized that with like a lightning bolt from God coming down on mankind. He says, we are sinners and we're guilty. And there is punishment for that. Death, separation, eternity, for eternity. So that's the penal part of penal substitution, the penalty for our sin. Aha, but... There's also a substitution part of this. So, if you imagine a courtroom and God is the judge, and we are standing before him, and we're guilty of our sin, which we are. All of us have sinned. None are, none are righteous. No, not one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We're sinners. God says guilty. Punishment. He's about to, he's about to declare the, the sentencing of eternal separation from him forever. And then Jesus bursts through the door, the back of the courtroom, you know. And he says, stop the proceedings. I'm going to take his place. I'm going to take her place. 
Let me take the punishment. I will stand in as a substitute. Penal substitution. The penalty substitute. And so Jesus, because he is God in the flesh, because he was righteous, because he'd never sinned, he's able to do that. God says, yes, you are the perfect sacrifice. You are the spotless lamb. And so... God's wrath, God's justice is transferred to Christ and not to us. And on the cross, Jesus bears our sin, as we've talked about. And he bears that wrath of God. And we're set free from that. We're forgiven for that. Okay, so the main idea in this image, and the other one is freedom, but the main word that you would associate with penal substitution is forgiveness. Forgiveness for our wickedness. Forgiveness for our sin. Because Jesus bears it on the cross. Our sins are paid in full by Christ. Now this was the understanding, this way of understanding the atonement makes sense in light of the Old Testament. In light of the sacrificial system. You know, you think about the day of atonement. Atonement, right? Yom Kippur in the Old Testament. And that whole concept of that day was that, was that man's sins, God's wrath, would be transferred onto these animals instead of onto us, right? They would have this literally called the scapegoat, where the priest would lay his hands onto this animal, this goat, and, the, and symbolically the sins of the nation of Israel were transferred onto this goat. And then the goat was driven out into the wilderness, and Jesus on the cross was like our scapegoat, where he, he bore all of that. It also makes sense in light of God's covenant with Abram. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks ago, where God promises Abram, he says, if you don't keep your end of the promise, remember they did that walk, the bloody path walk through the animal, the torn apart animals. God walked it alone and didn't let Abram walk through. And God said, even if, if you don't keep your end of the bargain, if you fail to keep the covenant, if you fail to remain faithful to me, I alone will bear the punishment, the penalty. I will take the consequence in your place. And Isaiah 53, 5, as we read, the punishment, the penalty that brought us peace was upon him. He was our substitute. So that is the penal substitution theory. So that's another way of looking at it. And then there's one more, and this one is called the moral influence theory. And this is also uh, an old, another ancient theory. So back in the book of the year 1000, when Ans uh, Anselm said, I think, uh, uh, Anselm said, I think that this was the sort of the penal substitute theory, then a guy named Abelard came along. And Abelard, A-B-E-L-A-R-D, Abelard said, you know what, I don't really think that this is that the primary focus of the cross is so much about uh, freedom from sin and evil and the devil. And I also don't think it's so much about God's wrath being poured out on, on Jesus instead of us and therefore forgiving us. He said, I think, Abelard said, I think that the primary message of the cross is not that the cross did something, but that the cross is saying something, that the cross is telling us something, that there is a message radiating from the cross, that there is something that this is saying to us, and that that message that the cross is declaring to us is love. This is what Abelard said about the year 1000. And we have, we call this now the moral satisfaction, or the moral influence theory. And this is that the cross is radiating a message of love. Romans 5.8 God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the moral influence theory, what Abelard proposed, was that, was that Jesus' life was a life of love and he died as a martyr for the cause of love. And, and this theory would say that the longer that I gaze at the cross, the longer that I stare 
at the sacrifice of Christ, as I look upon the face of Jesus, and I look upon all that he did, as we've talked about this morning, as I laid it all out, what he did for us, as we stare at that and look at that, the more that we understand that I could even go so far as to kill him, and yet he loves me anyway. Yet he pursues me anyway, like we've been talking about. The more that I stare at that, the more that that influences me morally to turn my face towards him. The more that that influences me to turn my heart towards him, to head in his direction, to face the cross and to take up my own cross and to follow him and to love my neighbors and to be more like, to be more like Jesus. And, and this theory would say, and our salvation is essentially found in that, right? We say that to, to, to be saved is to be a follower of Christ, right? To be saved is to follow Jesus. And so in becoming his dedicated followers and in living a life of love inspired by the cross, we are saved. Okay. So those are the three main theories of the atonement. And the main emphasis of this one, of course, is love. So, is it this one? Or is it this one? Or is it this one? Yes. 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 I think he did all of that and more on the cross. William Lane Craig, one of my favorite apologists, theologians, he says, the atonement is a diamond with many facets. Another author, Joel B. Joel B. Green, he refers to the atonement as a kaleidoscope. He holds to the kaleidoscope theory, and I, that's what I hold to as well. Many different colors and aspects to the cross that all at once show us a picture of what Christ accomplished. So is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Yes! Yes! Now you may say, well, they don't exactly, you know, maybe there's some contradiction. Well, you know what? Yeah, maybe there is a little bit here and there, but look at all that Christ accomplished. That's what I want you to see. Did Jesus' death on the cross win our freedom from death, sin, and the devil and set us free? Did it? Absolutely it did. Did Jesus' death on the cross take the punishment that all of us deserve and lay that on Christ rather than us resulting in our potential for forgiveness from our sin through faith? Absolutely it did. Did Jesus' death on the cross reveal the extent of God's love for us? That he was willing to even let mankind kill him and yet he maintained his love, motivating us, influencing us to turn our hearts fully toward him and live new lives? Absolutely that's true too. Honestly, I see no conflict. I praise God and I thank Him that in one single act on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago, in one enormously painful, horrible, excruciating, sacrificial moment, He was able to accomplish so much. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the, cross is, uh, message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It doesn't make any sense. He says, what is it? This is guy dying on a cross. What's that got to do with anything? But for those of us who are being saved, for those of us who are in the know, for those of us who have experienced, experienced it, we say, no, the cross it, the, the, is to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Look at all the power of God expressed through the cross of Christ. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I'm getting fired up. You guys seem like you don't care. But I'm telling you what, this is the best thing ever. This is the best news. Do you care about this? Amen, let's get some amens. This is good news, guys. This is the whole thing. This is the most important moment in human history. This is the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. Care about that. This is serious stuff. Now, if you've already experienced this beautiful exchange that's taken place, praise God, I hope that this message reminds you of all that Jesus has done. Maybe helps you see new facets of this diamond, new parts of this kaleidoscope of all that Christ has done for you, and that you will be thankful for that. 
and cause you to love Jesus even more for the incredible sacrifice that he underwent for you. That's my hope from this message. And if you haven't experienced that beautiful exchange yet, then my prayer for you is that you will recognize your need for the atonement. That you will recognize your need for this freedom and forgiveness and to experience the love of God. Accept it, receive it in simple faith. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. On Good Friday, this Friday night, we're going to gather here. We're going to celebrate communion. That'll be the focus of the service. Short service, low-key service. I hope you can come. And on Sunday morning, we're going to celebrate the great moment of victory when we celebrate the resurrection. Let's close with a hymn. And when I thought of this hymn, I was quite impressed with how it sort of highlights the many things that Christ accomplished on the cross. It almost sort of touches on all three of those atonement theories. So at number 307, please grab a hymn book. It's, the words won't be on the screen. One of the red books in front of you. Number 307. And can it be that I should gain?